There's one mistake that I see people making time and time and time again on a vegan diet. It's so simple that when I tell you, you won't be in the least bit surprised. But listen closely because this could make or break your vegan diet. Thousands have failed because of it. It leads to unwanted weight loss, nutritional deficiencies, fatigue, and an inability to grow muscle. The one main thing is not eating enough. I know, simple, right? But how many of you can honestly tell me how many calories you're eating daily? How many of you even know how many you need? Using my background as a PT and nutritionist, I'm gonna show you how to work out and supply your needs so that you can thrive. Now, the main problem is that whole plant foods are higher in water and fiber and so are more calorically deplete. In other words, we need to eat more than we did in our previous diets. To ensure that you get enough calories, a total daily energy expenditure or TDEE calculator can be useful. Type TDEE into your browser and a website will come up where you'll be prompted to enter things like your age, sex, height and weight, etc. The better ones will ask for your body fat percentage. If you don't know this, go onto Google Images, type body fat percentage chart and just compare your body with those of the models featured. You will then be asked your activity levels to provide a modifier so that the program can work out the amount of calories you need to maintain your body weight. It would be good practice for the first week or two to leverage a food tracking app such as Chronometer so you can get a handle on the amounts of food you need to eat to ensure success. To make sure that it's working for you, I would suggest a weekly weigh-in. Take your weight at the start of each week, in the morning, after the loo, and before you eat or drink anything. One week later, re-weigh with the same protocol, and if your weight is what you're aiming for, then congratulations, you've cracked it. If it's higher or lower than you'd like, then tweak your calories accordingly. On average, a 500 calorie surplus or deficit will see people gain or lose around one pound per week. Now, some may struggle to eat a sufficient volume of food at first. Of course, you could add in junk foods that contain refined sugar, refined grains, and refined oil, but these can drive disease in the body. Not only that, but because they displace the more nutrient-rich whole plant foods, deficiencies are likely. In the interests of good health, I would invite you to double down on the more calorically dense whole plant foods. Legumes, whole grains, tropical and dried fruits, nuts, seeds, whole nut and seed butters and avocados will be your best friends. Smoothies are healthful and can be a very good tactic for those that need to ingest more volume of food. I would, however, discourage ingesting fruit juice. Their sugars, no longer attached to fiber, act very differently in the body and can cause harm. Believe it or not, we now know that fruit juice drives Alzheimer's, the top killer of UK residents. A strength or physique athlete could benefit from adding in one or two servings of a more processed protein food. Protein powder, tofu, seitan, and textured vegetable protein are all good choices. Are they as healthy as the whole plant foods which they displace? Well, no. Are they healthier than meat, eggs, and dairy? <laughs> yeah. When struggling to eat adequate amounts of whole plant foods, it is wise to limit lower calorie items. Things like apples and kale should not be eliminated altogether, however, for fear of missing out on vital vitamins and minerals. Again, use a food tracking app to check nutrient status. It may sound like a little bit of a headache, but you'll only need to do it for the first week or two until you get the hang of it. Plug your foods in and see if you're coming up short on any particular vitamins, minerals, or essential fatty acids. A quick Google search will soon let you know which plant foods to then emphasize. As far as possible, it may be healthier to provide most vitamins and minerals through the diet. However, I will shortly discuss some instances where this may not be the case and that we're better off leveraging supplements. If you'd like to optimize your health, body shape or performance with a vegan diet, then please check out my new online nutrition course. I've launched it at a low introductory price. It contains 14 videos, two cookbooks, and masses of downloadable and printable PDFs, including a complete nutrition chart for all ages and stages of life, so you can be sure that the whole family is thriving. For the greatest chance of fulfilling all possible nutrients with food, I like to, at most meals, include at least one legume, one whole grain, one fruit, one vegetable, one nut, one seed, one herb, and one spice. In other words, I'm including the range of whole plant foods. 
In this way, we can also take advantage of the concept of food synergy. Simply put, nutrients in one food can amplify health benefits such as cancer protection and antioxidant load of nutrients in the others. Legumes include the myriad of different beans, plus lentils, chickpeas, and split peas. Whole grains include things like wheat, rice, barley, and oats. And more ancient grains such as quinoa, amaranth, teff, and farro. When it comes to vegetables, it's a good idea to emphasize greens, particularly dark leafy greens. These are great for things like vitamin K, calcium, iron, and magnesium. To ensure adequate carotenoids, the precursors to vitamin A, we should include some yellow, orange, or red produce too. Because the colors are the antioxidants, I like to include something from each color daily. Sea vegetables, aka sea weeds, are often overlooked by people. However, because most soils are depleting iodine, these can be an important addition. Two sheets of nori, one teaspoon of dulse or arame flakes, one and one eighth of a teaspoon of wakame, or one sixteenth of a teaspoon of kelp powder should provide you with the 150 microgram minimum RDA. Personally, I avoid hijiki, which contains appreciable amounts of arsenic. In addition, one should be careful not to exceed the 1,100 microgram safe tolerable upper daily limit for iodine. By and large now, dietitians do not recommend seaweeds for those suffering with thyroid disease. This is because of potential natural variability in seaweeds, which can be up to sixfold. For this reason, I recommend that such individuals stick to an iodine supplement. In terms of fruit, as I say, I like to include at least one serving with each meal. They're all very healthful, however, berries are the real stars here, so I like to include at least one serving daily, typically at breakfast. Fruit and veg is best sourced either fresh, frozen, or dried. Frozen produce can often be more nutritious than fresh, depending on exactly how fresh the fresh stuff is. Canned produce loses nutrients, and the plastic linings can contain hormone-disrupting xenoestrogens such as BPA, BPF, and BPS. Nuts and seeds should be eaten daily as these provide the essential fatty acids omega-3 and omega-6. In terms of omega-3, things like ground flax, ground chia, plus hemp seeds and walnuts should be emphasized. If we're relying on food for omega-3 and we're ingesting these ALAs, which are the short chain versions, it's important that males shoot for at least 3.2 grams per day and for females, 2.2. It's important that we balance omegas 3 and 6. We don't want more than about a 3 or 4 to 1 ratio in favour of omega 6. In terms of both flavour and health, it's good practice to add in herbs and spices at each meal. I eat a range daily, some of the more common ones being turmeric, black pepper, ginger, cinnamon, mint, oregano, parsley and coriander. You can also drink your herbs in tea form, of course. Some of my favorites are green tea or matcha, chamomile, mint, and hibiscus teas. For the greatest chance of the best overall physical and mental health, we now know that the health of the gut microbiome is paramount. We want the most diverse range of fiber-fermenting Prevotella bacteria living in the colon as possible. How do we achieve this, you ask? by eating the most diverse range of whole plant foods possible, along with their myriad of different fiber types. Although there are certain types of food that I emphasize and eat almost daily in each category, I also take a care to eat a wide variety of other foods too. It's best to cook with so-called wet heat methods, such as steaming, microwaving, and steam frying. It's also good practice to include some fruits and vegetables in raw form. Dry heat cooking methods like baking, roasting, and grilling create toxic compounds such as oxygen-free radicals, advanced glycation end products, and acrylamides. These molecules accelerate the aging process or potentially lead to cancer growth and so are best limited. I particularly caution against frying with oil. Supplements-wise, all vegans should take vitamin B12. Choose a chewable, sublingual, or liquid supplement and ideally take on an empty stomach. Over 65s with their lessened ability to produce intrinsic factor should take at least 1,000 micrograms daily. In the absence of adequate sunlight exposure, a vitamin D3 supplement is recommended too. According to the science, around 2,000 IUs per day should be optimal for the average adult. 
Earlier, we talked about ALA, the short chain version of Omega-3. There is some science to suggest that it may be beneficial for some to add in a DHA supplement, which is the long chain version of Omega-3. If you'd like to give this a go, then around 250 milligrams per day would be a good dose for an adult. You can either do DHA or a combined EPA and DHA. Before I wrap up this video, just a quick word about how to commence a healthy vegan diet. Now, some people go straight to eating a 100% whole foods plant-based diet with no real issues. Others may experience temporary gut problems. Bloating, gas, pain, constipation, diarrhea, and constipation with diarrhea are all possible. Usually the culprit is the gut microbiome, the types of bacteria that we've invited to live in the colon predicated on our former food choices. Over time with the new diet, the pathogenic bacteroides strains of bacteria will die off and the healthy fiber processing Prevotella types will prevail. Once this happens, then the issues will likely be no more. If things get too uncomfortable, however, I would recommend taking a few short weeks in order to transition over. Week by week, take out a little more of the unhealthy foods and add in a little more of the healthy fiber rich foods. It shouldn't take too long until you're fully transitioned. If you feel like this video is useful, then please share it around. And for everyone else, now click this.